stuff like this. Okay. Okay, can you hear me? Both uh, in the room and uh, at the closure? 20 minutes, okay? Yeah. I have some slides. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can you hear me both in presence and on Zoom? Okay, yes. Okay, so thank you for, uh, for the invitation and thank you for uh, being here. Um, so I'm yeah, very happy to present this work. It's uh, joint work with my supervisor, Immanuel Abbe, uh, Jan Hasla and uh, Christopher Marchis, everyone from ETFL. And uh, yeah, the title is uh, already self-explaining, uh, self so I will uh, explain how in uh, some setting uh, an initial alignment between uh, the neural network architecture and uh, the target function is uh, needed to learn with uh, gradient descent. Uh, so, uh, deep learning combines uh, uh, successfully uh, over-parameterized networks with uh, descent algorithms. And so, in the framework of uh, trying to understand uh, how these two elements are combined, we, we pose the following question. So, we ask whether uh, we need some uh, knowledge of uh, the target function in uh, our neural network arch architecture uh, in order to learn with gradient descent, or whether gradient descent can learn from uh, any uh, arbitrarily small uh, initial, uh, initial alignment. And the goal is uh, uh, to answer this question, but of course also to quantify both uh, the initial alignment and uh, the learning horizon, learning accuracy that, uh, that we aim for. Uh, so, uh, before diving into the definition of uh, the initial alignment, uh, let me clarify which uh, framework. We, we consider. So here is a spectrum of uh, neural network architectures of uh, increasing complexity. So on the left side, we have the most uh, structured and regular architecture, so fully connected with uh, uh, IID in uh, initialization, for instance. And uh, then going to the right, we like allow for uh, more complexity, so we can include uh, convolution networks, ResNet, and so on. And on the right side, we have uh, the, an extreme. So we have uh, what we call the free neural networks family, so which include any architecture that is, uh, we can have any, any structure. The only constraint is uh, uh, that it has to be implementable in a, in a computer in, uh, in polynomial time. And so some previous work considered the, uh, the right extreme, so these free networks. Uh, and, uh, Ask the question whether, uh, so which functions are learnable by any polysized neural networks? And uh, so closer to our question, they also ask, uh, uh, does the learnability depend on the initialization? And uh, so it turns out that uh, if we don't put any, uh, any constraint in the structure of the network, then one can find uh, a neural network that is uh, an initialization that uh, is universal, that can learn any, uh, any pack learnable function. And uh, so, which means that the neural network does not need an initial alignment with the target function to learn. And also the limitation of consider some set, this setting is that uh, there are classes of function that are uh, not learnable uh, irrespective of the initialization if uh, these holds in particular if uh, we train with large batch size. So yes, yeah, so to hope for a positive answer to the previous question, uh, we need to put some structure in the architecture and uh, so in this work, we consider the left extreme of the spectrum. We consider a regular neural network, so particularly fully connected with IED initialization. And we ask if, uh, uh, given a fully connected network with a certain initialization, we can uh, understand whether uh, our target function is uh, easy or hard to learn, and specifically hard to learn for uh, a fully connected architecture, not for any architecture. Uh, so the definition of initial alignment is, uh, is as follows. So for a target function f with uh, input space x and uh, input distribution px, and uh, a neural network uh, uh, with parameterized by some weights, including n theta, and uh, with uh, initialized at random from a distribution, p0, we take for uh, each neuron v in the network, or, so each of these blue points and the red points, we take the uh, average over the initial distribution of uh, the correlation between the uh, target function and the output of the neural network at the neuron V at initialization squared. And then we take the maximum uh, among all neurons, uh, all these neurons in the network. And so the question can be uh, rephrased as follows. If uh, we have uh, 
If at initialization there is uh, no neuron in the network that picks a good correlation with the target, does this imply that uh, after a uh, reasonable horizon of uh, gradient descent training, uh, the correlation uh, will still be small? And so the network will not have learned. And uh, yes, yeah, so as I said before, we, co we consider only fully connected networks for our theoretical result, but so here is an experiment for a convolutional uh, network. So the definition of final makes sense for any architecture and for any input distribution. Uh, so here we took the CIFAR data set and uh, split it into pairs of tasks. So for instance, we consider only the images belonging to classes of cl cat and dogs and perform binary classifications for uh, these two classes. Same for uh, bird and deer and uh, um, frog and track. And for these uh, three tasks, we estimated the initial alignment. So this is just uh, two expectations. This can be estimated with uh, Monte Carlo simulation. And uh, also we don't need uh, explicit knowledge of the target function to estimate the null. In fact, uh, instead of uh, f of x in the definition, we can just put uh, the label. And uh, we can see here that indeed there is a, a good correlation between uh, the uh, initial alignment. So for example, for cat and dog, uh, here is very small. Uh, and also the generation accuracy after training is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is smaller compared to other uh, tasks where the initial alignment was larger. So for instance, for frog and tracks. And so, yeah, for the theoretical result, we um, consider, uh, we, we restrict to the Boolean setting. So we consider, we assume the target function to be, uh, to map the Boolean hypercube of dimension n to plus minus one, so uh, binary classification. Uh, we assume the input distribution to be uniform also. And we assume f to be uh, asymptotically balanced, so to have plus one and minus one appearing with the same, uh, with the same frequency as uh, the input dimension goes to infinity. The, yeah, the network is again fully connected with uh, Gaussian IAD initialization with the rescale variance. So the weights on uh, layer J will, be, will have variance once over uh, nj minus one, nj minus one be the number of neurons in the j minus one th uh, hidden layer, and uh, rail activation. Then uh, we can generalize also to uh, a larger class of activations, but for this talk I will uh, mention only uh, rail activations. And the algorithm is uh, noisy gradient descent with uh, a full batch. So at each step, uh, we take the uh, full uh, gradient, the full population gradient. Um, we clip it to the interval minus a a. So this means that uh, if we assume that uh, the uh, gradient is uh, contained between minus a a, and whenever it exceeds, we force it, we clip it to the interval uh, minus a a. This is for technical reasons. And uh, also at each step, we inject some Gaussian noise with uh, uh, variance sigma square. It's the same setting as uh, some of the previous works. And so before uh, the main result, I uh, still need another definition. So we um, introduce the uh, extended version of f, which we call f bar. It's a function that maps the uh, Boolean hypercube of dimension n square instead of uh, n. Uh, two plus minus one in the following way. So the first n coordinates correspond to the n entries of f. And then we add uh, coordinates from, from xn plus one to xn squared. These are just uh, dummy variables or uh, uh, coordinates that do not impact the, the output of uh, f bar. And so the main result is as follows. So if a function f has uh, uh, initial alignment with a neural net, with a Gaussian uh, ReLU network as uh, discussed before, that decreases as uh, n to the minus c, or faster. So this is a big O of n to the minus c. So we care about the uh, behavior, the initial alignment as the input dimension goes to infinity. Then the noisy gradient descent algorithm, uh, after uh, uh, t steps of training on uh, uh, any fully connected network uh, with E weights uh, and any initialization, output uh, a network was correlation with uh, the extended function f bar can be controlled by a term that uh, depends on the uh, learning rate, uh, the uh, training horizon, uh, the number of weights, and the uh, uh, gradient precision of the, uh, the algorithm, and a term that depends on the initial alignment. So the, the first message of this theorem is that uh, in so somehow, in some senses, the uh, initial alignment characterizes uh, 
whether f is weakly learnable uh, uh, on Gaussian real networks in the sense that uh, if the initial alignment is very small, so if this uh, constant c is uh, uh, very large, uh, uh, then uh, and if the neural network is, uh, is uh, so then we need either a very large neural network or uh, we need uh, a very large number of uh, training steps uh, to achieve non-trivial correlation. So when I mean weakly learnable, I mean really that uh, weak learning, I mean uh, achieving non-trivial correlation with the target function. And on the other sense, if the null is, uh, is large, then, uh, uh, so if this constant is small, then this means that uh, somewhere in the network, uh, the, uh, the function will be learned already at initialization. Uh, however, the result is stronger than that. In fact, uh, if uh, a function f has uh, a small initial alignment with a Gaussian ReLU network, uh, this means that it is hard for uh, any fully connected network uh, with any initialization. So, this includes also uh, n networks with uh, uh, non-Gaussian initializations and uh, other activations that are not ReLU. And uh, yeah, the, the caveat that, uh, so the price that we have to pay for this is uh, that we have to uh, add this caveat, so this FR, so we can prove hardness uh, only for the extension of F, not for the original F. And so yeah, this caveat is somehow not trivial in the sense that uh, if we try to prove uh, the same theorem without this f bar, then uh, it's, uh, it's, there, is, there are counterexamples. So one can construct a network and an initialization. Uh, specifically, it will be a random bank initialization that, uh, uh, and, and a target function that has very small in but that it is learnable. Uh, however, the hope is that for uh, if we restrict to Gaussian initialization then uh, the hope is that uh, one can remove this, uh, this F bar here. But uh, yeah, for now, this is left for future work. Uh, for now, we can, leave, we can remove this F bar if uh, we impose uh, some uh, uh, constraints on F, so specifically if we assume F to have sparse uh, high degree coefficients. So for, uh, for the proof, uh, we make uh, extensive uh, use of the uh, Fourier-Walsh transform. So any Boolean function can be expressed in terms of its uh, uh, Fourier-Walsh transform, so in terms of a sum of uh, parities. So this chi s is uh, the product of uh, all xi with i in s. And since we are in the Boolean world, then uh, this is just uh, uh, the parity over, uh, over set s. And uh, yeah, these, uh, these parity functions, they, they, they form a basis of the uh, Boolean, Boolean space of Boolean functions, so one can write f in this way, and these uh, f at are uh, just the uh, projection of f on the uh, basis elements, and these are called Fourier coefficients. They form the Fourier spectrums, and uh, we use them to, to prove uh, uh, hardness, to characterize hardness of, uh, of f. Um, so the, yeah, to do this, we, we, we add another definition, which is the Fourier weight of f up to degree k. This is w less or equal to f. This is defined as the sum of the Fourier coefficient square uh, on any set that is of cardinality less or equal than k. And so the, the proof then goes by two main steps. Is it good? Okay. <laughs> Two main steps. So the first steps we prove that uh, if uh, the initial alignment is small, then uh, f is a uh, high degree, and in the sense that uh, we can bound the uh, Fourier degree, the Fourier um, weight of f uh, by a term that depends on n to the k plus one and uh, the initial alignment. Uh, so if the initial alignment is small, this means that uh, if we write f in terms of uh, uh, its Fourier basis, then uh, f will have only high degree terms. So it will be a high degree in the sense that it will be really a sum of uh, only high degree monomials. And the second step consists of proving that uh, these high degree functions are uh, hard to learn uh, for, uh, for the noisy GD algorithm on fully connected networks. And so for the first step, the, the main idea is to uh, since the initial alignment is uh, the maximum uh, among of neurons of uh, the average correlation, uh, we can restrict to the neurons in the first layer. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, so here I substituted to the neural network, uh, this is the output of uh, uh, the neural network of neural V if V is in the first layer. So it's just a perceptron with a relative activation top. And so if we can prove that uh, 
uh, this guy is small uh, implies that uh, if it's high degree, then also this is a stronger statement than the original uh, statement. In fact, uh, the, if the null is small, then also uh, the null in the first layer will be small, and uh, then uh, if this implies that if it's high degree, we, we are good. And uh, yeah, to do this, we, we use uh, in the Fourier Walsh uh, expansion of f, which is uh, uh, very convenient because then also the initial alignment can be expressed in terms of uh, uh, weighted sum of initial alignment with uh, with parities. And so then the the final step is to uh, characterize this, uh, this, uh, this this initial alignment between parties and uh, uh, perceptron with rail activation. And uh, the idea is that uh, this depends on the degree of the parity. And, uh, and that for any parity of degree k, the initial alignment is uh, at least uh, an omega to the minus k plus one. So it uh, decreases at n to the minus k plus one or uh, slower. And so this concludes the proof since uh, uh, this means that low degree parities will have good, uh, will have large uh, initial alignment with uh, a Gaussian radio network. And this means that for the initial alignment to be small, we need to have uh, for low degree parities uh, these coefficients to be very, very small. And yes, yeah, so the, the proof of these two lemmas is, uh, is technical, but uh, yes, this, uh, these are the two main ingredients of, uh, of the proof. And then for the second step, which is proving that uh, uh, high degree functions are uh, hard to learn, we can, uh, the, the, the idea is, to, is that uh, see the, the fully connected networks are invariant after permutation of the input, and the idea is to use this invariance as a limitation to learn uh, uh, high degree functions. In fact, uh, the, the, we, we, so to quantify this, uh, we construct the orbit of f from f, which contains any function that is composed by composing f with uh, a, a permutation of, uh, on the input space. And to show that if f is high degree, then uh, the orbit of uh, f bar is not learnable. And uh, so the reason why this is true is uh, can be uh, quantified by taking the cross predictability, which is a measure for a class of functions that uh, was, introduced, uh, was introduced in uh, Abel Sandon in 2020. And uh, it is the uh, average correlation squared between uh, two functions from our function class, which uh, in this case is the orbit, sampled uniformly at random. So it in, uh, in measures how uh, informative are two uh, functions chosen at random from, uh, from our function class. And so the idea is that uh, high degree functions are, uh, are very, very, very low uh, cross predictability. The, the idea is that so high degree parities uh, are, uh, are, very, are, very, are very, yes, are, are very low cross predictability. In fact, we can just change uh, one input and uh, they change completely the, the output. And, uh, and then we can adapt a uh, previous result to uh, show that uh, the correlation can be controlled for uh, function classes with low cross predictability. And so then to, to conclude, uh, yes, so we believe that uh, we can uh, extend to uh, other non, uh, to all non-polynomial activations. For uh, polynomial activation, this is not true. In fact, uh, if we consider, for instance, uh, the, the squared activation, uh, then uh, already the parity of degree three will have uh, initial alignment, uh, zero initial alignment with this parity, with this, uh, with this activation. Uh, but uh, the parity of degree three is, uh, is learnable by, by neural networks in general. So we need, uh, uh, technically, we need a, an activation with uh, uh, infinitely many non-zero Hermite coefficients, uh, and for polynomials, this is not the case. And uh, the other is to extend to other architectures. So uh, the problem with, for instance, convolutional neural networks is that these are architectures that are not uh, invariant uh, to permutation of the input. So then for the second part of the proof, we will need to find another class of invariances and, uh, and work with it. And uh, the other is to extend to other input distributions, so for instance, to Gaussian inputs or to uh, inputs uh, that are on the sphere. And uh, so here, uh, one would need to use another basis that is not the Fourier basis, for instance, the Hermite polynomials. But uh, yeah, we believe that main of, um, most of the techniques that we use here are, uh, can be applied to this, uh, to this case. So then I'm done, and thank you for, uh, for your attention. <laughs> Thank you.
very nice. Thank you very much. That was a very nice start. Um, can somebody on Zoom confirm that they hear me now? Can somebody on Zoom? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Thank you, Francesca. Um, we have time for a couple of questions, and then, of course, you know, we'll have more questions during the discussion. I see a first question there. Thanks for the talk. I just wanted to ask, so uh, you're talking about the learnability of the function defined over the entire space of inputs, basically, because you take uh, some IID distribution. So what I wanted to know is what you think about how about you have this function defined on some data manifold and how difficult it is to learn the function on that subspace of all possible inputs. Uh, so you mean instead of consider uniform uh, the, as an input distribution, that uh, uniform distribution over the hypercube consider another uh, distribution? Uh, yeah, so you're ready with the bias if we assume that instead of... Um, the uniform distribution of the hypercube, some distribution that uh, has some bias on uh, plus one or minus one uh, IAD already among all the coordinates. Uh, already these, uh, we have problems. Uh, it's already, it really doesn't hold. So yeah, it's, it seems that it's uniform distribution, it's really a challenge. Or, or even if we extend to other, um, to other uh, input spaces, uh, we still need to have symmetry of uh, distribution. But except for the, I mean, for the technical part of proving it, do you think it still holds? It's still hard to learn the function or it becomes easy if you restrict the, the space of inputs? Um, I mean, possibly the INAL can still characterize uh, this case, like from uh, the experiments it seemed there could be still by some trade-off. Uh, uh, but yeah, I'm not sure how to, how, how to then uh, like uh, reason about it. Thank you. We have time for another question. Uh, can you just pass the microphone? Thank you very much. Uh, I have just a question about the non-polynomial activation. So do you think that uh, non-polynomial activations are, uh, I mean, are they ne necessary for your proof? Or do you think they are necessary for the good behavior of the neural network? So they are necessary if you want to have a measure that characterizes weak learnability. So if you want to, yes, yeah, so basically what we are saying is that uh, uh, for hard function, we will not even escape the initialization for uh, in polynomial time. And uh, to do this, we need to, and like to hope that then uh, like uh, in non-polynomial time or in larger time, we will escape this activation. We need to have uh, expressivity, weak expressivity of, uh, of our target function. And for, uh, yeah, for uh, if we have polynomials, then we will have limits. So for instance, we can prove it. If we have a polynomial of degree k and one layer, then we can prove it only for parity, for uh, functions that expressed in the Fourier basis uh, contains parities up to the degree k. So we will not be able to prove for any Boolean function. Um, so, um, so you mean that if I have a neural network with polynomial activation, it will not learn well? So if you have a polyno uh, neural network with polynomial activation, it will have limitation in learning uh, high degree functions. Okay, okay. okay. thank you. And, yeah, and the initial alignment will be zero, you will not be able to then prove uh, that if you have low, uh, low initial alignment, uh, you have high degree function. Thank you. Great, we have time for maybe one more short question. If there's any, yeah, Marco. Uh, I was wondering if you could quickly elaborate on what other input distributions you can tackle with uh, this kind of uh, techniques. So we can tackle uh, with very similar, so for the first step, so prove it that in all small uh, implies that the function is high degree. We can, for instance, do it for uh, um, Gaussian inputs. So in the Hermite basis, so this will have that the function will have only Hermite coefficient in the tensor basis of uh, tensor Hermite uh, expansion. Uh, problem with that then will be the second part, because uh, to prove that what's a high degree function, uh, it's uh, you have high degree like in the in the Boolean case, a high degree function means that uh, it depends on many coordinates. So you cannot have uh, x1 to the k with coordinates because uh, this is either is either x1 or uh, one. 
in uh, if you are to the real world, then uh, you will have a high degree function. Like it's uh, it's a bit more complicated to then uh, characterize high degree functions because uh, you have to count how many times it's, uh, each coordinates appear. So, yeah. Problem. Wonderful. Let's thank Elizabeth one more time. Thank you.